Greetings, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, and welcome to this, the fourth Sunday in Lent, also known as Latare Sunday, but more on that later. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. of Joshua chapter 5. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day. They ate the produce of the land and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Word of God, word of life. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter five. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ God has reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, 
and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors of Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you to, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Word of God, word of life. Return to the Lord your God 
for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning in the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the prosperity that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to that far country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on, and he replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry, and he refused to go in, and his father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen. For all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a younger goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like the word love or the word friendship. These are words we use and we understand intuitively, yet when asked to define them, they become strange and slippery things, don't they? Just like the kingdom of God, which is probably why our Lord so rarely exposits directly on this theme, but instead draws pictures and tells parables. He shows rather than tells. Today's lesson is a great example of that. It's one of the three parables our Lord tells about lost things, a parable to help the Pharisees present understand why he welcomed sinners and ate with tax collectors. 
Today we just hear the third in that cycle of parables, the one our Lord tells about a man and his two sons, but which is often called the parable of the prodigal son. In truth, it's a parable about the kingdom of God revealed in the prodigality of the father. After all, prodigal doesn't mean someone who returns, but someone who spends money lavishly or wastes resources in an extravagant manner. And who is it in this story who outspends everybody else? It's the father's prodigality that out-prodigals the so-called prodigal son. That's the heart of this parable. Yes, it's a story of repentance and forgiveness, but first, it's the story of a homecoming, reflected not just in the son's return, but in God's tender heart turned toward us saint and sinner that we are. See, we so often want to divide the world into the good and the bad, the deserving and the undeserving, the sheep and the goats, but God looks at the lot of us with uncompromising love, so beautifully expressed in the undignified image of this father running out to embrace his ritually unclean son, filled with joy at receiving back the one who had formerly turned his back upon father and brother alike. Remember, Luther insisted that quorum Deo, Latin for before God, we are passively righteous, right? We didn't earn God's favor. It's God who does the justifying work, God who forgives us in Christ. But quorum mundo, before the world, it's our work. It's we who actively seek right relationship with self, with others, with creation. And it's in that horizontal realm, cora mundo, that we so often fail. That we continue to live as sinners, forgetful of God's mercy in Christ. And because we live at the intersection of this horizontal and vertical realm, Luther says we are simul justus et peccator, simultaneously saint and sinner. Saints because righteous before God on account of Christ, but sinners by habit on account of our failure to love each other. This Lutheran vision is summed up quite well by the Russian Orthodox novelist and Soviet dissident, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who said that we often operate with an overly simplistic anthropology. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, he wrote. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. This is the sinful humanity whom God embraces in today's parable. A picture of the kingdom of God, a picture of homecoming, not in some heavenly dimension utterly removed from this place, but here and now, God's clandestine kingdom hidden in the world, advancing in, with, and under the kingdoms of this temporal order, like leaven working its way through dough or a seed silently sprouting under the soil. That's the kingdom of our prodigal God who spends his love on his human creation, on all of creation, with a reckless extravagance that defies expectation, with an abandon that far exceeds our most generous thoughts. A God who even while we were a long way off ran toward us, rejoiced over us, celebrated our homecoming and prepared the finest feast. Now there's a saying among some of the earliest Christian teachers that this parable is the key to interpreting the whole of the Bible. Because were all the Bibles in the world to be suddenly destroyed tomorrow, but this one parable remain? The whole of the gospel could be extrapolated from this one image of a father's embracing his wayward son of a homecoming 
and a feast of repentance and forgiveness. Now, there are many ways to read this parable. In this season of Lent, we could focus on the younger son's sin, his rejection of his father, his wasteful existence. We could reflect on what drives humans to despair, what turns us around in repentance. Or we could contrast the younger and the older brothers, imagining what kind of churches we would have if only populated by the elder brother type, complainers who look to others, other Christians, other churches, and envy their success, who begrudge the imperfect a place at the table. Contrast that with a church filled with grateful sinners who take no good gift for granted because they know they are undeserving, yet they've experienced the Father's lavish welcome. They've been changed by an encounter with his forgiveness such that their gratitude leads them to love with the love that they've received, extending hospitality to all and not just hunkering down inside the four walls of the church, but running out to welcome sinners, those who are making their way homeward. That is the kingdom of God in action. But the truth is our churches are filled with people like me and people like you. Elder brother types from time to time, getting caught up in gossip or grumbling, carried away by envy or bitter jealousies. We should be taking our cue from the younger brother, of course, thankful for God's mercy and grace. Yet sometimes in our judgmentalism, we begrudge our own kindred access to the nice cutlery and the finest food. This is one approach, one focus to take in this penitential season of Lent. But the thing is, this Sunday is a special Sunday. It's Litare Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Lent, also known as Middle Sunday, the halfway point because we're just 21 days out from Easter. And it's a time, traditionally, for breaking from the somber mood and setting sights on that empty tomb because Latare Sunday is to Lent what Gaudete Sunday is to Advent. It's a Sunday for rejoicing. Which is why I've saved the oldest interpretation of this parable for last. See, the kingdom of God is a hard thing to explain, far easier to fire the imagination with images that stir our hearts and raise our minds toward heaven. To that end, consider for a moment what it's like to be a foreigner, an alien, an outsider. I remember being a shy kid taking my first swimming lessons at the YMCA. I didn't know my teacher. I didn't know any of the other kids. But I remember eventually connecting with one young girl because she reminded me of my cousin Amy. Something about her face, her smile, the way she spoke reminded me of family, made me feel at home. And once I made that connection, suddenly swimming lessons wasn't a somber affair, but a joyful one. Maybe you've had that uncanny experience where you travel to a foreign country and you don't recognize anybody, but a part of you is looking for a friendly face, something that will make this place feel familiar. Maybe you spot a woman who reminds you of your late grandmother, or you spot your best friend's doppelganger, but there's something in us that's primed for patterns, reminders that we're not alone, signs of love and friendship, landmarks that orient us in time and space, that settle us down, that make us feel a little bit more at home. And here's where that other meaning of this parable comes in. See, early Christians taught that beyond the literal interpretations, this parable was also an allegory of the incarnation, a story of the son's journey into that far country the story of how our Lord is our brother, how he takes his place among sinners, becoming a lowly servant and being made unclean on our account. But to what end? So to take his father's inheritance and squander it on us. 
to give us the kingdom, to bring us home with him. This is the same story, the same archetype we find in Philippians 2, that early Christian hymn that goes, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be held on to, but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself, debased himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we have the story about a father's glory, which is his children. That's a father's glory is his children. Yes. Is this a story about a penitent sinner? Absolutely. But finally, it's a story about God's son journeying into that far country only to return and to be welcomed and exalted and to be thrown a feast, not just for his sake, but for the sake of all who are in Christ. See, this parable judges the son. It doesn't hold up his actions as exemplary, but it also forgives him. It redeems him. So too, our Lord, fully God, fully man, will be judged on that cross for our sin, for our sake. And yet also for our sake, he will be vindicated, raised to new life, ascending to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. This is finally a parable about the kingdom of God, the homecoming for which we are all longing and for which we are given glimpses in this life that homecoming which is drawing near. For do we not daily pray, let your kingdom come on earth, in our families, in our churches, in our cities, as surely as it is in heaven. See, God's kingdom is always coming. And in fact, it is already here. If we could but learn to recognize God's love in the familiar face Jesus turns toward us, in the human face of every stranger, who is seeking God. There is a contrast here, of course. The wayward son in the parable returns to the father empty-handed. But the Son of God declares to his heavenly father in John's gospel, I did not lose a single one of those whom you entrusted to me. It is Christ who returns us to our Heavenly Father, that prodigal God who embraces us in Jesus Christ. May each of us live close to the gratitude of that younger son, eschewing the presumption and envy of the elder. But above all, may we trust in our Father's tender mercies, which are new every morning. Amen.
Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need responding. Receive our prayer. Jesus formed the disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy. Mindful of this, Lord, we ask that you would lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness and hospitality and celebration. Send us out to share the good news. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make the land to produce a harvest that sustains your entire creation. Equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil. Nourish the earth with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Heal grounds tainted by pollution or misuse. Help us to receive all of your gifts with gratitude rather than grumbling. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We acknowledge before you, O Lord, that countries are divided and leaders often harbor grudges. We ask you to reconcile nations that are experiencing conflict. We especially pray for an end to Russia's war with Ukraine. Act quickly to bring an end to conflicts in our world, in our families, in our own hearts. Make us to be peacemakers, we pray. Merciful God, receive, receive our prayer. Your people cry for help in times of distress. Deliver those who live with abuse. Save those experiencing financial hardship. Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving, those we name aloud or silently in our hearts. Console us with the promise that everything is being made new. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bring an end to hunger in our communities and around the world. And give each of us a deeper hunger for the cup of blessing and the bread of life. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The one who is dead is alive again. And so in anticipation of Easter and our celebration of the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, we give thanks for all who have died, confident that steadfast love surrounds them. Shelter us in your love until we are gathered at your heavenly banquet with all the saints who have tasted of your resurrection. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. you and keep you, make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.